All right, are we ready? All right, I'm Mary Garrett. I'm from St. Peter's, Missouri. And I am going to tell you about the wild pets in our family. My father grew up on a farm. And that influenced a lot of what he did with us. Um, when he first started his family, he actually raised rabbits for food. And we understood the difference between pets and food. And he raised strawberries for food until the birds got all of them. At one point, we had a pet cat that had five kittens regularly and then the Humane Society took them and found good homes for all of them that's what we were told and at one point we had a dog but the most memorable pets we had were those wild critters that just somehow seemed to come our way and both of my parents were very accepting oh I had hamsters too for a while and mom accepted that too but I had a mouse that I caught in the bathtub my, my mother woke me up a little bit early and said, come see, and I put it in a cage and I kept it for about nine months. Um, I had a baby bird that my brothers found somewhere and I fed it with an eyedropper. And I had that for quite some time too. My brothers would bring home snakes and my mother would tolerate that even though she was afraid of them. And as the big sister, I had to learn not to show fear because if you let your little brothers know they can get an interesting reaction from a snake, you will see a snake all the time. But if you just say, oh yes, that one's even prettier than the other one, but I think he wants to go back to his cage now. You don't get bothered with snakes as often. And my brother had an iguana for a while that was really mean. I've met some later that were really very nice and sweet and gentle pets, but his iguana was a rather vicious creature. We had pretty much whatever pet we were willing to take care of. I think my father thought it helped us learn about animals. My mother thought it made us happy, and having happy children was one of her goals. And so we were allowed to keep them. I didn't know I was allergic to cats and dogs. We had a dog for a while. Um, people didn't know about allergies back then, but now I do. And my father also told stories. He told family stories and he made up stories. It was his way of keeping us quiet at bedtime so we'd actually fall asleep. That was his gift to my mother, was getting us to go to sleep. And with parents like that, it's not surprising that when last December I found a tree frog in my kitchen, I made it a home. Got one of those big plastic storage bins, put some leaves in it, put some branches in it, put a saucer of water in it. He was very pathetic looking. He was white. He was so dehydrated. I didn't want to go out in an ice storm to get him crickets. Felt really bad about the fact that I didn't have any crickets for him. And I don't know if it was my guilty conscience or the frog was praying really hard. There was a cricket in the bathroom at bedtime to feed him. But then I shopped around and I found the best place for crickets because you know the Aunt Mary who gives the kids ice cream at breakfast is the same kind of frog hostess who says, oh, you don't like the two inch crickets and you don't like the quarter inch crickets. You like the ones that are exactly an inch long? Okay, I know where to get those. I managed to create a fussy frog. <laughs> I named him Prince because that seemed the right name and I sort of fed him like a prince. Oh, that one's too big? We'll put it outside. I'll get you a new one. He only would accept baby finger size crickets. And I was told they eat spiders. One showed up in my house and I said, Grandmother Spider, I'm really sorry to disrespect you this way, but I think the frog needs to learn variety in his diet. Plop, he wouldn't touch the spider. My friend Lucy said, of course not. Wouldn't you rather have a nice crunchy cricket as opposed to a fuzzy, hairy spider? So he only ate crickets. Well, I kept him for three months. Two weeks ago, I thought, it was time for him to have a chance at self-determination. He came into my house willingly. By the way, this pathetic little white frog had turned a brilliant, brilliant green. And then 
then started getting some brown because those eastern gray tree frogs can be any color they kind of want. The conservation guy said the brown hues were because it was getting close to mating season and they needed extra camouflage if they're going to be out there hopping around looking for each other. And so I looked at him and I looked at that beautiful 80 degree weather we were having. And so I took his little habitat outside. You know, like you take the baby out in the pram on a nice day. And I turned it on its side and I said, it's up to you, dear. And I sat and read a book for an hour and a half while he huddled under the leaves in his cage and refused to move. And the cricket that he was at that moment for refusing to eat because it was too big, it refused to move too. They both stayed in the cage. So in an hour and a half, I had to leave. I took them back in the house and said, it's fine. Whenever you want to go, you can go. As long as you want to stay, you can stay. You know, this is, this is not a prison. You are a house guest, not a prisoner. So the next day, he was waiting up at the top of the case. I took it outside, turned it on its side. He was out, up a tree, jumped 14 inches. The guy's only an inch big, 14 inches to another tree and quickly up higher than I could reach. I'm thinking, he knows he's ready now. So as my father's daughter, of course I was gonna let that frog stay in my house. And of course I was gonna take care of it. But as my father and mother's daughter, I was also going to use him for a story. That's my wild cat.